Hey everyone, I've got a bit of a different video for you today. This is a segment that I produced as part of a collaboration with the Goose Media on a deep dive into the housing crisis. My segment is about how we calculate shelter inflation in the consumer price index and how it tends to encourage higher home prices. If you want to watch the full video, which is about an hour long, I'll link it in the description. In addition to producing the segment, I also did some work on the script for this video. Now, I'm sure some longtime viewers of the channel will disagree with some of what's said in that video, but keep in mind that this wasn't my video, so I tried not to do too much editing in terms of what the opinions expressed in the video are. My comments were pretty much limited to technical accuracy and a little bit of punch-up. So even though the conclusions and recommendations reached in the video might not be exactly what I would say, I do think it's a good addition to the discussion because it's based in facts and evidence. Anyway, that's enough yammering for now, so enjoy the segment. That's right folks, it's time to learn about the Consumer Price Index and Canada's problems with how inflation is calculated for housing with your old pal Millennial Moron. But first, to understand why this is such a significant issue in Canada, I'm going to have to give you a very quick lesson on monetary policy and how inflation relates to interest rates. As you probably know, inflation is a measure of the increase in the overall price of goods and services over time. The Bank of Canada tries to control inflation by adjusting interest rates when the inflation drifts too far from their 2% annual inflation target. If inflation is too high, they raise the policy interest rate, which discourages people from borrowing and spending, which in turn reduces demand, which slows down price growth. Likewise, if inflation is too low, which is generally a sign of a stagnant economy, they reduce the interest rate, which encourages borrowing and spending and an overall increase in demand. Make sense? By the way, if you're wondering why they target inflation at 2% instead of 0%, there's several reasons, but the basic answer is that it's a lot easier to control inflation at 2% than it is at 0%. And having a little bit of inflation can actually help provide some incentive for people to invest their money into something productive today, rather than sitting on their cash and doing nothing with it. So now that we know how inflation is controlled, we need to know how it's measured, which is through something called the Consumer Price Index, or CPI for short. The CPI is basically a basket of goods and services, like housing, food, utilities, clothing, etc., where they track the prices, assign different weights to the items, then add it up to get the overall cost of living, which is then tracked from month to month. As prices increase over time, that's reported as inflation. As you might expect, the largest component of CPI is shelter, the cost of keeping a roof over your head. Because most Canadian households own rather than renting, owned accommodation is the largest component of shelter CPI, so naturally you'd expect the massive increases that we've seen in home prices to result in a big increase in shelter inflation. However, from the start of our home price benchmark data in January of 2005 to the peak in March of 2022, although the price of a home in Canada increased by a whopping 260%, the owned accommodation index only increased by 54%, with the overall shelter index increasing by only 49%. So how is this possible? The answer is that the shelter CPI only includes the cost of owning a home, not buying a home. The overall price of a home isn't included, at least not directly. Instead, CPI only looks at the day-to-day -day ownership costs, things like mortgage interest, maintenance, and insurance. In other words, the home ownership portion of the consumer price index assumes that you already own a home. Renters and owners are basically treated as separate species, with no accounting for the fact that some people might want to move from one to the other. One place that home prices are accounted for in shelter CPI is mortgage interest cost, which accounts for the cost of a mortgage using the average home price and the average interest rate on mortgages. The problem with this is, if home prices double and interest rates get cut in half, the CPI thinks there's been no impact on the cost of home ownership, even though it's gotten a lot more difficult for first-time buyers to get in. In fact, over the same period that home prices increased by 260%, mortgage interest cost only increased by 5.6%. But wait, there's more! The home price used in this calculation isn't the price of a home today. Because the typical length of a mortgage in Canada is 25 years and they're trying to account for the overall cost of mortgage interest, the home price they use in this calculation is an aggregate of the home prices over the last 25 years, weighted by how much of their mortgage they have left to pay off. So while someone who bought a house recently might be struggling with their mortgage payments, they're offset in the calculation by people who bought it 10 or 15 years ago, or even people who bought a house all the way back in 1999 for 15 cents! So, decreases in the interest rate can quickly make housing appear a lot more affordable in the CPI, even when it's getting a lot more expensive today. But wait, there's more! Because of this perception that less interest means more affordable housing, the government has implemented a number of programs aimed at giving people access to more debt at lower interest rates. One example is providing mortgage insurance through the CMHC, which incentivizes banks to lend people more money at lower rates with a smaller down payment, because the bank doesn't have to take on the risk of that loan. The basic idea is, if people can't afford a house at today's prices, we'll let them borrow more money until they can. The problem with this line of thinking is that home prices are not independent from interest rates, especially in a competitive market. Most people focus on what they can afford for a monthly payment, and the overall price of the home is more of an abstract concept, because the purchase is mostly financed by the mortgage. That means that when interest rates go down, home prices tend to go up. I'll give you an example. Let's say you have two people competing to buy a house in a hot market and they each have $2,500 a month that they can pay for a mortgage. 
at an interest rate of 6%, they'd be able to borrow about $394,000 to pay for the house, plus whatever they have saved for the down payment. Now imagine the interest rate drops to 1.5%. Now they can each borrow over $625,000 with the same monthly payment. Keep in mind, these people have been told their entire lives that housing is the best investment you can make, and if you don't have a house, you're just throwing your money away. So, are they going to agree that they don't want to pay a higher price for the house and they'd rather have a lower mortgage payment? Or are they going to use that extra borrowing power to bid the price of the house higher and higher until they're once again maxing out their mortgage size? The problem is, the mortgage isn't the only cost involved here. As the price tag goes up, the down payment required gets larger, things like real estate fees and land transfer taxes get higher, and it becomes more and more expensive to cross that gap from renting to owning. On the other hand, if you're someone who already owns a house in this neighborhood, suddenly you've gained over $230,000 in equity for doing absolutely nothing. On top of that, your much smaller mortgage has now gotten a lot cheaper to carry because you're paying less interest on the same amount. This long-term trend of falling interest rates under the pretense of making housing more affordable has effectively created a situation where existing homeowners are being both enriched and subsidized at the expense of first-time homebuyers. But, because these buying costs aren't included in the CPI, there's no pressure for interest rates to go back up to compensate because our inflation calculations think that the cost of housing has barely changed at all. This has led to millennial homeowners carrying much higher debt loads than previous generations in order to get into the housing market because they've stretched the limits of what they can borrow at the lowest interest rates in history. Of course, the major risk of taking on huge amounts of debt at rock-bottom interest rates is that if interest rates go up, your mortgage payments will start skyrocketing at the same time that the value of your home starts to drop. Of course, that would only matter if the Bank of Canada did something crazy, like say, raise interest rates by 475 basis points over the course of a year and a half. And as of October of 2020, I have it on good authority that rates are going to be low for a long time, so I'm sure there's nothing to worry about.